part of that talk I gave, there's a dating concerning with like carbon-14, which everybody sort of knows about, versus thermoluminescence. And oh my goodness, they just don't agree. Carbon-14 was said it's 26,000 years old. Thermoluminescence says 10,000 or less. Oh my goodness, how do you do this half of the half of the time? So you get another method. You look at dendrochronology, that is the study of tree rings. You count tree rings, line them up, and guess what? The tree rings agreed with thermoluminescence. The time is less than 10,000 years. That was the essence, well, I did a lot more that I won't bore you with, but that was a part of my talk. This was an interesting conference. There were other talks in there. And uh, one of them was on dinosaur fossils. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, recently, within the past two years, they have found tissue inside the fossil, living tissue. Well, it's not living, but it's tissue that used to be there. Blood vessels included inside the tissue of a dinosaur. Now, there's no way that tissue should last millions of years. And so this brings up the whole question, how old is this fossil really? And they've looked at a number of them. As a matter of fact, um, the conference that I was at, this is one of their quarterlies. This is a scientific publication that talks all about the, it's a, they call it the iDino project, special report on dinosaurs, fossils, and especially the tissue that's within the bones. They were doing electron microscopes uh, of them and so on. Also, a book has been published, Echoes of the Jurassic, Discovery of Dinosaur Soft Tissue. And this may bring up to you your mind, oh, Jurassic Park. Well, you can't quite make a whole dinosaur out of just the DNA tissue that's there. It doesn't have enough. But it is living tissue. They can stretch it. It's, uh, sorry, not living, but uh, tissue that can be stretched, tissue that still exists, of course, somewhat decayed. Most tissue, if, uh, if you bury somebody, the tissue is gone in a whole oh, way, maybe 100 years or so, depending on the burial conditions. If it's a fossil where it got buried quickly, it could last a couple thousand years, but not millions. So, another interesting thing that they found is that uh, I mean, you may have heard of this, the X chromosomes of a mother, daughter, grandmother. They can trace those X chromosomes and what's gone on, and if we have one mother, we go back far enough, we have one mother for all of us. They have just found out the Y chromosomes between father, son, and grandfather, the same thing. We have one father. We have one father and mother, all of us. And what does that say? Adam and Eve were real. So, interesting conference. Uh, there is a lot more behind all of this. I hope to give you a few more items today. But I want to take a little bit of an important principle from all of this. I just gave you some examples. Now, what happens usually is people will present facts and then from the facts, they make assumptions. Always look at the assumptions. This is true whether it's creation or uh, evolutionist. And the point is, is that if you look at the assumptions, what assumption seems more reasonable? What, is, what makes more sense, if you want? Just because a man comes up with an assumption doesn't make it right, okay? So, one of the principles I want to address, and this affects not only the church, but it involves our tr trust in the truth provided by the Bible. I don't know, I just encourage you all to read your Bible. And uh, if we go to my statement, We usually have a different statement than this on Sunday morning, Pastor Jay uses. I made this one 
for my own to make a point. This is my Bible. It contains absolute truth from page 1, Genesis 1-1, one, one, through the 66 books. There are 66 books in this Bible. It provides me with steps for integrity, ethics, and morality as I follow the one and only true God who inspired every word. With that statement, you see, I've uh, said that you can rely upon the Bible. This is my statement. I stand behind this. And there have been many who have had problems because they hear man's ideas, especially in the schools. And you don't, I must admit, you don't hear many sermons like what I'm going to give you today. Uh, I will stand behind every word. I've done research in the area as well, and I will say that every research points this direction. So today, what is our society? We have a society that believes there is no absolute truth. It's whatever you think. And if you think it's right and somebody else agrees with you, then it's absolute. I'll tell you, that's not absolute truth. That's the truth of, of agreement between two people. It's called the horizontal dimension. This is the way uh, people rely on it. It's man to man, man to woman, etc. Horizontally, we are agreeing with each other and saying, this is what I believe is the truth. So if you do that, you can, whatever you come up with, it's truth according to you. We need, and what we've had in the past, is a vertical truth. God provides the truth down to us. And we need to have an absolute basis for what we claim to be truth. That basis comes from this, every word inspired by God. And for an example, what this happens is there was a poll done in 2010 indicated that those in their 20s and 40s, okay, 21% don't believe the Bible is true and historically accurate. 21%, one-fifth of the people in their 20s and 40s. 70% have not read the Bible in its entirety, only some parts for comfort. 22% believe the Bible is a collection of writings by wise men, but not at all inspired by God. So if I could have 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is what the scripture says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there's a whole sermon on the second part of that verse, but I want to take the first part. And it says, going back to 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That actually, the Greek word used there, and I hope I can pronounce this correctly, new, uh, sorry, theonustos, theonustos. Theo means God, nustos is Numa, N-E-P-N-E-U. That's like wind, breath. Uh, stosis means the breath of. So, every scripture is given by the breath of God. The breath of God. He's, it's God breathe. So that's what the First Timothy is telling us. So, I just have to give a quick personal thing here. When did I first realize about the Bible? You know, I, and I can understand many college kids, what they go through, because I went through it. I was in an English class, and we were studying some great stuff, all about our founders of the nation and how they were deists and how there was pantheism, polytheism, and all these other isms. And I was getting taken up with this. Oh, this sounds great. So, one day when we were going home, my future wife at that time was riding with me. I took her back and forth to school, and I just felt ornery. Now, usually I don't feel ornery at all, but I always felt ornery. I just wanted to get in a deep discussion with her. 
you know. And what would get her going? Well, I knew what would get her going at all. Where's where heaven? What is heaven? Is there a heaven? You know, I, I had all kinds of questions. And we could talk about streets of gold, all that kind of stuff. So started, we got in the car, and I said, how do you know you're going to heaven? <laughs> she says, because the Bible tells me so. And, you know, after that, she probably went on all for the next half hour talking about the Bible and everything else. I had no idea what she said, because God was dealing with me. He says, look, you're getting all into these isms. You haven't even read my word. How do you know who I am? I went home that night and started in Genesis 1-1 and went right through. You know, Leviticus didn't stop me. Many people, they get to Leviticus and it's like, whoa, man. No, just kept on going. Boy, God had really gotten through to me. I needed to know his word. And I've since read it through many times. I don't, I don't even know how many times I've read through the Bible. But let me tell you, that is the words of life. You need to have them. So when 20%, 21% don't believe the Bible is true or historically accurate, they are missing, missing the truth, the real truth. 22% believe the Bible is a collection of writings by wise men. No. Second Peter says men are moved by the Holy Spirit. They spoke from God. So continuing with the results of this survey, 83% stated that they were taught in school about evolution, and those ideas caused them to question the church and to leave the church. What they were leaving, they wouldn't say it this way, but they're leaving the truth of God. 89.5% believe Noah's Ark, but Noah's Ark is only a myth because it could not contain all the animals and maybe it was only a local flood. Hey, if it was a local flood, let's walk over the mountains. Besides, the water covered 15 feet, 15 cubits above the mountains. So no matter where you go, the earth is flooded. That's the way it works. You don't need a boat if you know it's a local flood. Just get out of there. And there would have been other people who would have made it then, other animals. So 18%, and this is a sad statement, 18% said their pastor compromised Genesis as being not real and not accurate. It's full of myths and legends. 18% of churchgoers hear this from some pastors. You will never hear it from me. It is not a myth, it is not a legend. Let me tell you, another popular thought given by some theologian, excellent, intelligent, sorry, start again. A popular thought given by some theologians and intellectuals is that the Bible was written for the culture of the time. We are more sophisticated today, so we don't have to have fairy tales to explain the beginning. Adam and Eve were not real. Oh, come on. That's their ideas, okay? So, I already told you that science now has proven that there's an Adam and Eve, okay? So that's the first thing. Uh, it's only written for the people of the time. No, it's written for everybody. God made sure everyone could understand it, see it, and live by it. It's written for you today. It's written for your children, written for your grandchildren. It was written for your people, your grandfather, etc. So Jesus had some things to say about this from uh, Matthew 19:4. He answered and said to them, "Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female?" Jesus says from the beginning. Adam and Eve were there from the beginning. Luke 17. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Wait, something's wrong here. 26. That's 16. <laughs> I knew that wasn't what I wanted. That's a good verse, though. <laughs> 
as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So Jesus says there was days of Noah, there was a flood, he's stating it. Let me ask you, uh, any of the theologians yourself, would you dare to call Jesus a liar? You say that Noah's Ark didn't exist or whatever. You're saying, well, Jesus was mistaken. I won't go that far. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4 to 6 saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water by which the world then existed perished, being flooded with water. There's another verse. And there are a number of verses that actually fit with Noah and the ark. So where does this all come from? It's part of the original sin. You know, everybody heard about the original sin that comes down from Adam and Eve. What really was that in essence? Pride and selfishness. We are very selfish people. We want what we want, when we want it, as we want it, and nothing is gonna get in the way. That's generally the way we operate. That's the original sin. So anytime you have that feeling like, oh, I want that, careful, you may be falling into an original sin. So all this with the Bible and everything, I want to have you especially, here's the part to really understand. First Peter 3, 15 and 16 says, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. This is our society today. I'm sure you've all faced someone. How do we handle it? Generally, we ignore it, try to get around it. But the scriptures are encouraging us to be ready to give a defense. So know what you believe. If you have questions, those are fine. Get the answers. Find somebody, talk to somebody about them. Study the word. As a matter of fact, in Acts, Eight, we have an example, 30 and 31. Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the point and the scriptures even encourage us, give an example. You don't understand something, don't say, well, it's whatever man says or whatever philosophy is out there, go ask somebody. Come to me, be happy. I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you one thing, if you catch me with something I don't know, I'm gonna find out. That's the way I am, I'm sorry. So come to somebody, find out. Check what is meant by whatever verse you're dealing with. The basis that you need to operate from is the Bible is true, it is solid. It is what we can live our lives by. I feel bad about a lot of college students. They've lost that, what I just said. And instead they say, well, my teachers must know what's going on. They told me this, or I heard this, so I can't believe the Bible anymore. That's a sad statement. I mean, if you're rejecting the Bible, you're not just rejecting a word, you're rejecting the word of God. You're rejecting how God is talking to you. And if you reject a part of it, what part do you keep? What is true? 
If the first part isn't, well, how about the second part, the third part? How about that great promise that you want to live on, that comfort? If, if the first part's not true, why is that true? This is a question you have to answer for each of yourselves. The Bible in its entirety is true. So I wanted to give you a little bit from my desk again, some of the things about creation. This seems to be the major problem that many people have, many young people especially, they have with uh, creation and Noah's Ark. So these are just some of the evidences, facts, and how they fit with the scriptures. So we start with Genesis 1. Here's the major argument, Genesis chapter 1. It was evening and morning was the first day. Well, was it really 24-hour day? Well, this has caused all kinds of problems because the people want to try to line the Bible with evolution. And there are theories that regard that. Jesus said, from the beginning, God made them man and female. As a matter of fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that all three aspects of the God is are involved. God is evolved. And that is God the Father, obviously. God the Son, he's the light, the word. And John 1 says the word was with God, the word was there from the beginning. And then we finally have the spirit who was hovering over the waters. Brooding is another word that you can use for the works for the Hebrew. So, what are the theories? These are all evolutionary type theories that oh, various theologians have tried to explain away. There's the old earth day age theory. Each day is an age, 10,000 years or more. So, in other words, we could have four and a half million years. Okay, gap theory. There's a gap between, of time between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And of course, there's theistic evolution. God caused evolution, he worked through it. All of these have one major problem. When Adam and Eve fell, sin entered the world and death. So there was no death before that. If you're going to have millions of years, day age, age, uh, you know, day gap, uh, whatever, you have to have death occurring before Adam and Eve. That can't happen according to the scripture. So if you want to be true to the scripture, you have a problem with any of those ideas. And those are ideas made by, I'll call them Christians, by church theologians, to try to match up with evolution that doesn't work. No, just say you don't understand, that's fine, but it doesn't work to try to make something like that work. So the one that does work is it took six days to create. Read Genesis 1 and you'll see John 1. Uh, it's a literal Bible interpretation, but it also includes a catastrophe, Noah's Ark and the catastrophe that re resulted. Before we leave Genesis, there's an interesting point. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars was created on day four. Light was given before that. So the plants were created on day three. They were living without the sunlight, but they had light. And so on day four, you have Genesis 1, 17. People and this is the sun, moon, stars were created. And you say, well, the stars are billions of light years away. How does that work? God gives you an answer right here. God set them in the, speaking of the stars, in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. To give light on the earth. It also says in Isaiah 40 that he spread out the heavens like a curtain. So as he spread these things out, if he want, as he flung the stars out, he left the light kind of traveling behind. So the light was on the earth, no matter how far away through that star. Billions of light years, fine, but the light's there. The light has left a little trail behind. 
So, uh, we also include catastrophes with this Noah's Ark, which is a great catastrophe. How do we know what happened? We had a great experimental aspect happen called Mount St. Helens, 1980. It went off, the volcano went off. Some of you may remember, you could go back and look at history. You can see what happened. Within the month, they went back in there and they found canyons 100 feet deep, strata that are located already. And these are like a month old. In a month, these things were created because of the catastrophe. So if we look at the Grand Canyon, I have a picture of it. That's kind of small, but uh, you can, if you ever go out to Bryce Canyon, Zion Canyon, and then the Grand Canyon, you can see the layers and they fit together like that. That's Bryce is on the left, and the middle is Zion, and the Grand Canyon is on the bottom. And you go down to the very oldest rocks, way down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, they're pre-Cambian. There are no fossils in those rocks around the world. Only fossils you find is the Cambrian. They call it the Cambrian explosion because all of a sudden there's all kinds of fossils. And there are large animal fossils, not just sea life. There's sea life on the top of mountains, fossils of sea life on the top of mountains. How'd it get there unless the water was above the mountains? So how does that happen? Next uh, image that I have for you. These are polystrata, polystrate trees. They occur through different strata. In other words, a tree was growing and it got buried very quickly with different strata. Now, they would have decayed away if it took millions of years or whatever for that strata to form. There they are, growing through it. And it's uh, the one that's closest to you is, of course, still alive, but the one back there, there you see those trunks up back in the back. And then, finally, the next one, the Mariana Trench. This is the deepest part of the oceans. If you go down there, we still have where the earth broke up. That's where the fountains of the deep came from. And you know, if you take like Mount Everest and the Mariana Trench, you measure from the Mariana Trench, of the water be up like that, squares is squashed and all that the water would cover the mountains. That's how deep the trench is. And so it blew up, cracked the earth, and we have all kinds of things from that. I teach a creation course where we go into a lot more detail than this, but this is just to give you an indication that the facts that you see are sometimes misrepresented. Every ma major mountain range on the earth has fossils of sea life. Practically every culture on the earth has a story about a you know, great flood, Aztec, Incas, etc. The majority of the earth's mountains were formed afterwards, pushed up through. And they were, if they flatten all those out, there's enough water on the earth to cover mountains. Seeds still can germinate after being kept in salt water for a year. So, how big was this ark? Noah's Ark was uh, 50, 30 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. What the heck is a cubit? When I teach in uh, the university, I teach a course in metrology, the science of measurement. A cubit is a very well, well, sort of well-defined system. It goes from your elbow to the top of your big, longest finger. That's a cubit, generally about 18 inches. There's a royal cubit that's 20 inches. So, you know, everybody's got a different length cubit, depending on the length of your arm. If you wanted a table made, if you wanted a big table, find a carpenter who had a big cubit. That's the way you would find out what you want, you know, get what you want. But if you take that and put it in terms of feet, Noah's Ark was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high consisting of three levels. That's 1,500,000 cubic feet. That was, 
There was no ship bigger than that until the late 1800s. The St. Mary's is a uh, you know, cruise liner that, that is larger. But that's when the first ship was made bigger than Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is like some of the uh, things you see, these container ships and so on. You've probably seen pictures, unless you've been out to the ocean where they come in. Those containers are, well, of a size, let's say, Noah's Ark could contain 500 of those containers. This was a big boat. It's not the little one with the draft's head sticking out. Nice cartoon, but it doesn't fit. Noah's Ark is as like an aircraft carrier, if you want. It's a little smaller, but generally you can take Noah's Ark and fit in 26,000 animals easily. So that brings up the point where all the animals in there. Well, God said two of every kind. What's a kind? It's more like a family, not a species. If you look at the species we have, different dogs, for example, you got a poodle, you got a German Shepherd, they all came from the same kind, the wolf kind. The wolf has the genes within it to be able to produce these dogs. You'd have to do a lot of breeding. And that's what mankind has done. They breeded a lot of animals together to get a poodle, to get a miniature poodle, to get a German Shepherd. German Shepherd's the closer, of course, to the wolf. And so each one of these come from a dog kind. So each one that we call a species is really from one dog kind. Same for the cat kind. Your house cat actually comes from the lion tiger business. What is this? This is Mendelian genetics, which has been proven for a long time. He did it with peas, and it's uh, different colors. It's also our races. We call races. That's nothing more than the amount of melon you have in your body. Some of us are a little uh, less melon, so we're deficient as to those who have more melon. Why? Why do they melon? Why do you have that? If you're living in the south where it's hot and the sun is there, you need more melon. That's your protection. So God has made one human kind. I object when we talk about races. I mean, what's a race? Let's, let's do it on the color of the hair or the color of the eyes. Same thing. So we're all one race. We're all humans. So uh, we have, for example, well, forest in Antarctica. Oh, oh, sorry, back to the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were probably on the ark. You say, well, how can you put a large dinosaur in the ark? How can you put any one of you inside your mother's womb? You're too big. But you weren't at the time you were born. Dinosaurs, very small dinosaurs, could be kept in there, one of each kind. Dinosaurs probably existed. You look in Job, we see things of dinosaurs. Look in the natural uh, history. It talks about St. George and the dragon. The dragon is probably a dinosaur. That was going on. It's a story to say, well, it's a legend. Well, maybe so. But it could very well be real. Ice Age occurred after the explosion from Noah's Ark. We have forests that grow in Antarctica. If you dig down through the uh, ice in Antarctica, you'll find forests, you'll find palm trees. Of course, fossilized, but uh, they're down there. What about people? The lovely Neanderthal man. By the way, everyone that's either a, an ape or it's a man, it's a human. I have a picture. This is what they thought Neanderthal man looked like when he first came up. It's an artist drawing. Don't trust artist drawings. So they looked a little closer at the skeletons and the ones that they found, what Neanderthal was. And the next picture, there's Neanderthal man. Looks like Uncle Jack or whatever. <laughs> Honestly, he's there and uh, they have since discovered, looked into DNA of, of humans today, we all have some parts of DNA of Neanderthals in us. 
which li lines up with them. So Neanderthal was not a caveman. He obviously was a little different than us in that way he hunted and so on, but we're all part of Neanderthal. Neanderthal. So, um, Acts 17.26, he made all of us, I'm adding that, from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Yes, we belong to different tribes, if you want. We belong to the tribe of the United States, There's the tribe of Canada, north of us, but we're all one blood. One blood. We're together, brother. <laughs> all our brothers. So a worldwide flood explains a lot of geological features, and the Ice Age also covers it. There were fragments of fossils found all over. Complex fossils are found in early rocks where they shouldn't be. No fossils are found in the oldest rocks, pre-Cambrian, but in the Cambrian explosion, there we have some complex fossils right away. Fossils have been found traversing two strata of rock. One guy trying to swim, and he got buried. One strata is buried from his waist down, the other strata when he's trying to reach out to swim. He got stuck. Um, Many fossils consist of a few teeth, skull fragments, and so on. Lucy, everybody's heard of Lucy. He's got like a little piece of skull, maybe an arm bone here and there, and maybe a leg bone. It's not, not even a pelvis. Pelvis is a very in indicative thing for humans. Our pelvis is different than the ape pelvis. So our pelvis is made so that we can walk in a straight line. Ape pelvises are made so you've got to waddle because they don't have the pelvis. It comes around like my motorcycle handlebars. Look at the pelvis, you can tell ape or man. So there's real, no real caveman that has ever been found or transition. There is no transition fossils at all. So we have to walk in the right direction if you're going to realize what's going on. Speaking of that, if the first man and woman evolved, but they were 100 miles apart, and they had to find each other so they could reproduce, they'd have to start walking, first off, in the same direction. And I've done the calculation of the probability of this happening. You do, so they have to walk in the right direction. They can't get too far of an angle off or they'll miss each other. They have to walk that 100 miles and not stop or take time so that the reproductive cycle still could happen. Calculate all these probabilities, it's astronomical. It just won't happen. Dating, I already talked about carbon-14. Don't put that much stock in it. Carbon-14 is only good up to 5,000 years, which is the half-life. So why do I tell you all this stuff? I'm saying don't let anyone rob you of the truth from the Word of God. Science is showing that what we read in the Bible is true. It's there. So all aspects of science, as a matter of fact, if you look at everyone without prejudice, they show evidence for a recent creation, 10,000 years or less. Science agrees with the truth of the Bible. God is a miracle-working God, and if he wanted to create everything mature in one day, like an Adam and Eve, not babies, but full adults, he certainly can do it. He can do what he wants to do. The Bible is totally true. So be ready to give a defense for what you believe. In Jude it says, contend for the faith. Don't let it be robbed from you. I hope I've encouraged you. I probably went way too long. I'm sorry about that, but that's, see, I get going, I can't stop. <laughs> anyway, 
consider this. And if you know, especially a young person, I'm concerned about the younger folks, that they don't get deceived and pulled away from what God is really doing. God is right, true. He exists. And the Bible that he wrote through men is true, every word, inspired totally by God. So if you would pray with me. If for some reason you have been deceived and moved away from the Lord, you want to repent of that, I ask you, today is the day. Now is the time. Don't let it continue. If you would like me to agree with your prayer, just raise your hand. Praise God. Lord, we thank you that you have overcome all deception. Lord, just bless and help and encourage, for through your power, you can do it. Thank you, Jesus.